ladies and gentlemen, Elaine Strick. Edward Albee is indeed a playwright. He is a playwright of faith. He's a playwright of courage, of strength, of grace, of hope, and certainly of humor. I laugh out loud at what Edward Albee tells all of us is wrong with us. I'm not very much involved in Edward's private life. I um, send him Bay's English muffins every Christmas, and he invites me to his New Year's Eve party, and in New York City, that constitutes an intimate relationship. <laughs> <laughs> but I am very much involved and have been on two different occasions in his work. The first time in the 60s, I played in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? I played Martha at the matinee company. I had a stage manager named Mark Wright. Anyway, we played a game. I used to send him out at the end of the show to find out what the comments were of this knock your socks off play. And an uh, elderly sort of couple was going up the aisle after the play, sort of a Field Point Road, Greenwich, Connecticut type couple. And uh, she looked at her husband and she said, I don't care, Walter, you can say what you will, but married people do not talk to one another that way. <laughs> Walter said, Bernice, for Christ's sake, shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Edward, for trusting me with your magic. And thank God you were pleased with the results. There was a time this year when you could see Edward Albee's work in three New York theaters. Old plays and new. For 40 years, he has tested the limits. His and ours. A happy childhood? Not exactly. He was adopted by a well-to-do Westchester family. They were high horse people. They had the outlook of the privileged. From the beginning, it was a bad fit. Farmed out to the finest schools, he made flunking out an art form. All the while, he was scribbling away. The yearbook described him as ultra-poetical, super-aesthetical. He walked out of his house at 18 and went where all aspiring artists went, Greenwich Village. He supported writing with any old job. But after 12 years, he saw himself as a lapsed poet and failed novelist. He was lurching toward 30 when it came to him. I can't keep calling myself a writer. What have I written? He sat down at his kitchen table with the typewriter from his Western Union job. In three weeks, he was a playwright. I don't care if it makes any sense or not. I want that bench to myself. And I want you off of it. Now go ahead, get out of here. Now look who's mad. Go on, get away from here. No. Get off of my bench. Yeah, you have everything in the world. It was want. a scorching debut with two more one acts to follow. They took a stand, he said, against the fiction that everything in this slipping land of ours is peachy keen. I said stop it, Martha! I hope that was an empty bottle, George. You don't want to waste good liquor. Not on your salary, not on an uh, associate professor's salary. 
so here I am, stuck with this flop, this on, bog in the history department. Martha. Who's married to the don't president's Martha, daughter. Right. Who's expected right. to be who's somebody, not just Virginia Wolf, a Virginia nobody. Wolf, Virginia Wolf. A, a bookworm who's so Wolf's goddamn so complacent. You're gonna get it, baby. Be careful, Martha. I'll rip you to pieces. You are not man enough. You haven't the guts. Edward Albee looked us square in the eye, raised his voice, and told us our secrets. And all America heard him. He led the charge of young American writers, hell-bent on waking up the audience and changing the American theater. Sometimes in fashion, sometimes out. Good reviews and bad. He didn't give a damn. The play was the thing. He has been at it for 24 plays and won three Pulitzer Prizes along the way. A theater man, he has always given back. In the 60s, he gave his name, his time, and money to the development of the off-Broadway movement. Here and abroad, he has encouraged the ambitions of new playwrights. Since 1985, Professor Albee has excited and incited his students at the University of Houston. Not just telling them how it's done, but showing them. By putting to paper those distinctive, uncompromising words that make us squirm. I can't remember. What? Get your hands off me. How dare you? Sorry. sorry. Why can't I remember anything? I think you remember everything. Edward Albee has attained the deepest powers of which words are capable. Ladies and gentlemen, Irene Worth. The reason I'm wearing this amazing gown is that I wore it in that amazing play, Tiny Alice, written by Edward Albee in 1964. Nobody then understood the dress or the play. <laughs> and Edward won't explain his work. When a playwright sits down to write, this is what he confronts. He starts with nothing but a piece of paper, a pen, and an empty stage. Then comes an idea. In Edward's case, it was a park bench. Hence his first play, The Zoo Story. Here's George Grizzard, one of the two men who meet at that park bench. You have everything in the world you want. You've told me about your home and your family and, and your own little zoo. You have everything. And now you want this bench? Are these the things that men fight for? Tell me, Peter, is this bench, this iron and this wood, is this your honor? Is this the thing in the world you'd fight for? Can you think of anything more absurd? I was asked once to send a message to a university tribute for Edward Albee. Well, I put it off, and I put it off, and I put it off, and finally, at the last minute, this is what I wrote. Edward Albee is the smartest man I know, and I've met four presidents. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
Well, I told Edward this story later, and he said, which four? <laughs> Mr. President, I had not met you at that time. <laughs> I've been very fortunate to be in two of Edward's plays. One of them was Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? It was said of that play that it picked up the Broadway theater by the scruff of its neck and shook it soundly. Here is Elaine Stritch. George, who is out somewhere there in the dark. George, who is good to me and whom I revile, who understands me and whom I push off, who can make me laugh. And I'm going to choke it back in my throat. Who can hold me at night so that it's warm. And whom I will bite so there is blood. Who keeps learning the games we play as quickly as I can change the rules. Who can make me happy? And I do not wish to be happy. And yes, I do wish to be happy. George and Martha, sad, sad, sad. Redwood. The moment of truth always comes, and so it is with a delicate balance. Here is Rosemary Harris. What I find most astonishing, aside from my belief that I will one day lose my mind, but when? Never I begin to think as the years go by or I'll not know it when it happens, or maybe even has. What I find most astonishing, I think, is the wonder of the daylight of the sun. All the centuries, millenniums, all the history. I wonder if that's why we sleep at night, because the darkness still frightens us. They say we sleep to let the demons out, to let the mind go raving mad. Our dreams and nightmares, all our logic gone awry, the dark side of our reason. And when the daylight comes again, comes order with it. Thank you, Edward, for showing the darkness to us on this stage and for lighting it up for us again and again, for us and for all the world. 